appreciate you being here. Let me just turn on the auto captioning. And I will share my screen. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Just close out of all the rest of this junk. So um, I guess the first thing I did go through and grade the exam. So I think we uh, generally did pretty well on the exam um, comparatively. So um, oftentimes it's a pretty difficult course. So it is kind of all of a relative thing, but I think we did pretty good on the first exam. It's important to remember that if you are feeling like you wish you did better on the first exam, which is certainly not um, abnormal, that you do have a chance for your final exam to overwrite one of your midterms um, by the end of the course. Again, I'm much more interested in what you know at the end of our time together versus in the middle, either for us, I guess, in week two, or I guess probably the exams are in week three and week five, right? So after two weeks or after four weeks. Um, did anybody have questions before we get started today? All right, I don't see anything in the chat. Um, as always, you're welcome to either write something in the chat or to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question if you have one. So last night we tested you on what's going on with closed systems in thermodynamics, but moving forward for the next exam, we'll start to look at open systems. And the general process we've been talking about for open systems is first we wanna draw our control volume then we want to do conservation of mass. Then we want to do conservation of energy. Right? So we talked about conservation of mass is that dm by dt, or the rate at which mass is being stored or depleted inside of our system, is equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates in minus the sum of the mass flow rates going out. But one of the ways that we can uh, represent the mass flow rates in and out is the area times the velocity divided by the specific volume. Conservation of energy now is a little more complicated than it was inside of our closed system. And we're talking about rate equations. So this dE by dt term is the rate at which energy is being stored or depleted in our system. Then we have the rate at which heat transfer is coming in minus the rate at which work is going out by these fan blades that may be in the system. Then we have all the energy that might be coming in with the inlet mass flow rate, all the energy that might be going out with the mass flow rate. That's going to be our conservation of energy for these open systems. Now it does get a little tricky if kinetic or potential energy sticks around. That's true in the metric system as well. H, when we look it up, or specific enthalpy, when we look it up in the textbook, is generally in kilojoules per kilogram. These two terms here will generally be in joules per kilogram, provided our velocities are in meters per second and our elevations are in meters. It gets more complicated in the imperial system. Still, conceptually, these terms all mean the same thing. But here, when we look up H in the textbook, it's typically going to be in BTU per pound mass. But then we've got these two terms, the same terms that gives us unit problems in the metric system. It's more complicated here because first, we've got to divide by this G sub C, which is kind of like the acceleration of gravity. But it's also got some extra units because in Newton's second law, we had to force one pound mass to have a weight of one pound fours. But even after you remember to do this, you won't be in the right units because this typically, if your velocity is in feet per second or your elevation is in feet, these two terms will give you foot pounds per pound mass. And that's good because it's energy per unit mass, but it's bad because it's not BTU per pound mass. So oftentimes, but not always, because you know we could have a velocity in miles per hour or something, and then you'd get a different conversion. But if my velocity is in feet per second or my elevation is in feet, 
then these two terms will give us foot pound per pound mass and we'll have to divide by 778 because there's one BTU is approximately 778 foot pounds. So if kinetic and potential energy stick around, usually most important for nozzles and diffusers, then we have to know how to deal with the kinetic energy terms. And it's tricky in the imperial system and in the metric system, but it's the same two terms that give us problems. Four terms, I guess, because there's kinetic and potential energy with the inlet mass flow rate and with the outlet mass flow rate. So for closed systems, and, and again, I think people generally demonstrated their understanding of being able to do this in uh, closed systems, right? We had conservation of energy that we could simplify after making some assumptions. We found the work was the integral of PDV, the mass times the change in the specific entropy, but we or the specific internal energy. But in order to find specific internal energy, we needed to fix the state. So we needed to know if it was water or maybe refrigerant, something like that, where we're trying to figure out what the phase is, whether it's liquid, vapor, or some combination of the two. Or it could be an ideal gas, and then we have to decide whether or not it's going to be constant or variable specific heat. Now we'll also have a flow chart for open system problems, where the first thing we want to do is figure out what happens to the mass, often to find what's the mass flow rate at the different ports, the inlet and outlet ports. Then we'll say, what happens to the energy? So we'll start to do conservation of energy, which means that we'll have to make some assumptions about whether or not heat transfer or power or you know kinetic and potential energy are important. We'll probably get an equation that looks something like this. In this class, all the problems will be at steady state. So these d something by dt terms go to zero. We'll need to often assume that it's a simple system where either heat transfer is important or power is important. And then we're again stuck with this idea of we need to fix the states because that's how we're going to find the specific enthalpy. So when we get to that question, what's the fluid? we're still gonna have water or something like it where we need to know the phase and then look stuff up on tables. Or we're gonna say, oh, it's an ideal gas where I can say, oh, it's either gonna be constant specific heat or variable specific heat. So I think this is a pretty high level thing, but if you wanted to print something out like this for you know reference on the next exam or the next two exams, I think that wouldn't be a bad idea because this is sort of the general flow chart of how you do problems in mechanical engineering thermodynamics. Right, so we've talked about why we're doing this and, and I appreciate your patience with me, right? We're still trying to figure out individual processes, right? Now we've maybe got a good handle on closed system processes. We're trying to learn open system processes. And the reason we're doing that is because in different types of machines, when we string together these different processes in series, so in order, we can do really cool things, right? So that's how we can describe how an internal combustion engine works, or a jet engine, or a power plant, whether it's a nuclear power plant, or a natural gas power plant, or something like an air conditioner, right? Which is pretty important. Uh, hopefully you have an air conditioner running wherever you are today, because it's kind of hot, at least here in Rochester, right? So now what happens to the mass? We can define these different kinds of systems in different ways. So it turns out, even though this isn't exactly true, for internal combustion engines, we'll assume that the whole process, all of the processes involved in this internal combustion engine are closed. Now, it's not really true, but it helps us to get um, a solution we can work out with pen and paper. For all of the rest of these cycles, these sort of sets of processes that run around in series, we'll assume that they're open system processes. So these open system analyses are gonna be really important. We can classify these thermodynamic devices by what's the fluid, right? Because that's one of the big questions that we end up asking here. And it turns out that when we talk about things like internal combustion engines, jet engines, or it's not really shown here, but uh, natural gas power plants, those, the working fluid, is generally assumed to be an ideal gas. But something like a nuclear power plant, a coal power plant, or an air conditioner, we assume that the working fluid is something that can change phase, 
usually either water or some kind of a refrigerant. Another way that we can characterize these different cycles, these different devices, is to ask, what's the purpose of the device? And in mechanical engineering, when we're talking about thermodynamics, at least as an introductory course, we're talking about sort of definitionally, that's not easy for me to say apparently, thermodynamics, turning heat into work, right? So we'll talk about heat engines, right? Heat engines generally will burn stuff, or maybe it's like a nuclear reaction where there's some exothermic reaction, right? That's generating heat, and we're turning that heat into mechanical power. We're trying to make a shaft spin, or in the case of a jet engine, we're trying to make fluid or gas go really fast out the back of the jet, right? But then when we start to think about air conditioners, it's a little bit the reverse, right? Because an air conditioner, you may notice, won't work if you don't plug it into the wall, right? Or if it's a central air, you know, have it sort of hardwired into your uh, electrical power, right? And this is because in an air conditioner, we're generally running some kind of a compressor where we're putting mechanical work in, in order to trick the universe to transfer heat, or at least to look like it's transferring heat from a cold place to a hot place, right? So we can think about maybe your refrigerator, right? Your refrigerator, uh, it kicks on every once in a while. So if you unplug your fridge, it won't stay cold, right? But, um, but generally it's taking heat out of the cold place in your refrigerator, either the freezer or the refrigerator space, and it dumps that heat into the air behind the refrigerator. Now, um, my heat transfer professor, when I was an undergraduate student, talked a little bit about what he called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which is this idea that heat transfer only ever goes from high temperature to low temperature. And that is 100% true. So to make these air conditioners work, really we're making a machine that has two, two sides. One side is colder than your cold place, right? So you, so you have something that looks like a radiator that's colder than the air in your freezer. But then you have another radiator at the back of your fridge where, um, where the, it's hotter than the air in your, in your kitchen, right? Or the same thing if you ever put your hand uh, at the exhaust of a window air conditioner, right? Don't do this if the air conditioner is uh, not at ground level, um, right? But that air is hot that's blowing out the back, right? So these are the types of devices that we're interested in, at least in mechanical engineering. Although my brother, who's a biochemist, took a class called physical chemistry, which is thermodynamics of chemical reactions. So it's not like we can only use the tools of thermodynamics to describe these types of devices, but at least in this introductory course for mechanical engineers, these are the kind of devices that we tend to be interested in. So today we're going to do an example of an open system analysis on two different types of devices. One will be a pump, which hopefully is kind of straightforward, although there is a little bit of a trick, and the other will be a heat exchanger. Right? Heat exchangers are tricky because this idea of where to draw the control volume isn't a trivial thing to think about, right? So we will look at a pump first. So this example, I'm going to go through just in the slides. And then when we do the heat exchanger example, I'll go through that um, sort of in a document. So here we have a pump, right? The pump looks like this, right? There's some inlet, water is coming in here. There's an impeller, it's like a fan blade, right? So this is the part, this is the reason why you have to plug your plug into the wall. It's going to provide some power that's going to have this shaft spin and force this fluid to this outlet over here. Now what happens in pumps is we take liquid from some pressure, in this case 0.1 megapascals or 100 kilopascals, up to 0.6 megapascals or 600 kilopascals. We're told that at the inlet one, not only do we know the pressure, 
we know that the quality is zero so this is a subcooled liquid or a saturated liquid i'm sorry so it's it's at the right temperature for boiling but it's not boiling yet and we're also given the mass flow rate now pumps if you remember are like turbines where the general energy transaction that we're doing here is we're putting in mechanical power in order to increase the enthalpy or the specific enthalpy of the fluid. And the way that we see that in the fluid for a pump is that we increase this pressure, right? And that allows us to say, increase the elevation of the fluid because it comes out at a higher pressure, which makes it want to leave the exit, right? So we're asked to find how much power this pump is consuming. Right, so I could take all this information from the problem. This is a good strategy to have. Um, and we could turn this into a state table. Right, so we know that at state one, we have a pressure of 0.1 megapascals. I could have turned this into 100 kilopascals or maybe one bar, right? And the outlet pressure is 0.6 megapascals or six bar. And the thing I like about state one is I have two independent intensive properties. I know that I can fix that state. Hopefully you feel confident about being able to fix that state as well. State two, I'm a little bit more apprehensive about because I only have one piece of information at state two, and that could be a problem. But the good news is if you're doing an exam, you don't have to start with the numbers you can go through the symbolic process first. And that part's gonna be really similar for most problems, right? So knowing the symbolic process will really help you demonstrate at least some level under, of understanding of the problem, even if you get tripped up on how to fix the states, right? So here we have this kind of three point plan, right? For how to solve these open system processes. The first thing is where do we draw the control volume? Right. So when I draw my control volume here, I'm basically going to follow the walls of the pump while they're there. And then I'm going to have something that's perpendicular to the flow at the inlet and the outlet. Right. For this pump, this is kind of trivial. Right. But we'll see in the heat exchanger case, this is not always trivial. So it does help to think about where you're going to draw your control volume. Now we're going to ask what happens to the mass. Right. So the first thing that we'll assume, right? So we write down our general equation here. Always do this. Always start with these base level of the equations that are on our equation sheet, the equation sheet that I've made for you and put in the exam materials. We have dm by dt is equal to the sum of the mass flow rates in minus the sum of the mass flow rates out. I'm going to assume that the system is at steady state. And I'm also going to assume that it's not leaking. Right, so that means that there's one inlet and one outlet, that there's only two places where fluid can pass, and one of them mass is coming in, and one of them mass is going out. Now, as you do more and more of these problems, when you can make these two assumptions, it sort of starts to feel trivial. But on an exam, you always want to write down how you're getting to your answer. Your job as a student on an exam is to demonstrate your understanding, right? So you want to let me know how you're getting to the answer that you get to. Because if you just wrote down in this problem that the mass flow rate at the exit is 10 kilograms per minute, I wouldn't know whether or not you understand the problem or you just guessed, right? So here we know because we're at steady state and there's one inlet and one outlet, conservation of mass tells us that the outlet mass flow rate must equal the inlet mass flow rate. And we were told that that was 10 kilograms per minute. Does that part make sense? Okay, so two out of three parts were done now, right? Um, at least symbolically, and hopefully you start to see that, that the symbolic part can go pretty quickly. So now when we're thinking about this system, some of this becomes sort of engineering intuition to know, remember last class, and maybe you don't remember because maybe you were thinking more about the, the midterm, right? But we talked about generally the energy transaction that happens in each one of these components. And the job of the pump is to put mechanical work in and increase the enthalpy of the fluid. 
right? So the assumptions we're going to make are that it's at steady state. We're going to say that every time in this class, that it's one inlet, one outlet. We already made those two assumptions when we did conservation of mass. So you have to make the same assumptions throughout the problem when you're talking about the same component, at least when you're drawing the same control volume. We're going to neglect changes in potential energy. There is some slight difference in height between the inlet and outlet, but we'll assume that that's not that important and that the changes in velocity are not that important. Remember, we looked at changes in velocity in the turbine problem that we did last class. Or if you don't remember, you can always check the notes. The other thing we'll assume here is that the heat transfer, here it says from three to four, but this is in this pump, is if it's not zero, at least we're going to assume that it's much less than the power, right? If you put your hand on this pump, right? Never a great idea when something's operating, right? But if you did, probably this pump is going to be hotter than the ambient air around it. So it probably is losing heat, but it's probably losing a lot less heat um, than the power that's going in, right? Otherwise, it's a pretty terribly designed pump and you should buy a new one, right? So when we talk about turbines and pumps, we get that W dot is equal to M dot in H in minus M dot out H out, at least often. If we were given some kind of heat loss term, then I would add that, right? But from conservation of mass, we already saw that the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out. So I don't need the subscripts here because there's only one mass flow rate in the problem. And that will tell us that W dot or the power consumed by the pump is equal to M dot times H in minus H out. Remember I made that little joke last time that, um, you know, if you're talking about turbines and pumps where there's mechanical work, you know, I think of the dwarves from Snow White that they're super hard workers, right? And the song that they sing is hi ho, right? So it's M dot times H in minus H O, H out, right? And then I let the first law worry about the signs, right? That heat in is positive, but work in is negative. And because this is a pump and I'm putting work or power into the system, I expect this power term to be negative. And that's because I'm increasing the enthalpy of the fluid. H2 should be bigger than H1. Now we have the symbolic solution, right? We're at the point where I know M dot, right? I don't know W dot, but that's the thing that I'm trying to find. If only I could find the inlet and outlet enthalpies, or at least the difference between the two, then I could solve the problem. And this is the thing, um, ideal pumps are a little bit tricky, right? Because we don't have enough information to find H1 and H2, right? But the first question, whenever I'm trying to find H or delta H is to ask myself, what's the fluid, right? So here the fluid is water. And when the fluid is water, I've got to ask myself, what's the phase? The thing about pumps, the difference between a pump and a compressor is that a pump has liquid water where it's increasing the enthalpy and a compressor has ideal gas where we're increasing the enthalpy. But their jobs are the same. So here we have water is our fluid. So when I draw my TV diagram, I'm going to do a vapor dome, right? I know state one has one bar or 0.1 megapascals and that it's a subcooled liquid, that X is equal to zero. So that puts us right on the subcooled liquid line over here. When I go through the pump, my pressure goes up to six or 0.6 megapascals or six bar. But I don't have enough information yet to fix the state. I know that it's somewhere on this line, but I don't know where. I assume that it's liquid, that my pump is not boiling the water. Um, you know, if you think about like a pump in a fish tank, if it's sucking up water from the tank and, and spitting out steam, that's not too good for the fish, right? So the purpose here is to 
take water in and put water out. Right? But at least I can fix this initial state, right? So here, state one, I know that we're at one bar and I know that the quality is zero, so I want HF or 417.4 kilojoules per kilogram, right? If the problem ever cared, I know that the boiling temperature of water at one bar is a little bit less than 100 degrees, right? Because if you remember, um, water boils at 100 degrees when we're at one atmosphere, which is just a touch more than, uh, than one bar. If I wanted my specific volume here, I can pull that out to VF. Specific volumes for liquid water are almost always about one divided by a thousand. Okay, so I got some stuff that I can put in my state table for state one, but I don't know how to fix state two. Here's the trick, right? So when you ask, is the fluid, when you, when you ask what's the fluid, and the answer is it's water, right now we have three things that we're going to ask then. Is it a subcooled liquid? Is it a superheated vapor? Or is it a two-phase mixture? We're going to add a fourth thing to that list, and we're going to ask, is it an ideal pump? Because if it's an ideal pump, we have another trick to figure out what's going on. I know what the pressure here is but I don't know what the temperature is. Before the end of today, we'll have a better um, description, a better idea of what we mean when we say that the pump is ideal. But for right now, I'm going to tell you that an ideal pump is a pump where the temperature doesn't increase. right? Where, where the power that we're putting in, all it's doing is increasing the pressure of the liquid and it doesn't increase the temperature of the liquid right so now i know the temperature and i know the pressure maybe that can help me right but i'm also going to say right and we can see this as we increase the pressure the boiling temperature goes up right um that's what a pressure cooker does um the reason food cooks more quickly in a pressure cooker is you can still braise it you can still cook food in the liquid Right? But because it increases the pressure, it increases the temperature where the water boils. So you have um, water that's at a higher temperature than you would get if you stayed at atmospheric pressure. So this is still going to be a subcooled liquid. Right? So it's still, it, it hasn't boiled. Right? Now, what we said for subcooled liquids was that, oh, I can just assume that H is approximately equal to HF at this temperature. But I did that for state one, too. And that would mean that H is exactly the same across these two um, states, inlet and outlet. And then my analysis would be telling me that I don't have to put any power in. That I can just leave my pump there. I don't have to plug it in, and it's still going to work. Right? But we know that that's ridiculous because we uh, live here on Earth. We know that that's not how things work. So that assumption must be a little too simple in this case. Must be a little bit too much like a cartoon. Right? So we have another way of doing this for ideal pumps. And this is important to remember. We'll get some practice, but this is important to remember. If the fluid is water and we're dealing with an ideal pump, then we're going to remember that H, the definition of enthalpy, is that it's specific internal energy plus pressure times specific volume at whatever inlet or outlet we're talking about. So I'm going to substitute that into my equation for power. And I'm going to see that I get U plus PV at the inlet minus U2 or U at the outlet minus PV at the outlet. Does that part make sense? So now here, because we're going to say that the important thing the pump does is increase the pressure, but it keeps the temperature of the fluid the same, we're going to say that the specific internal energy doesn't really change in the ideal case because the temperature stays constant. If we just did this for H, 
like we said before, we get that the pump power was zero. So we needed to make the problem a little bit more complex. And now we're just canceling out the change in the specific internal energy. So we can say that for a pump, the power is going to be the pressure or the mass flow rate times the pressure at the inlet times the specific volume at the outlet minus the pressure at the outlet minus the specific volume at the outlet. Now, just like the temp or the, the specific internal energies were about the same because we assumed the temperatures are about the same, we can assume that the specific volumes are also going to be about the same because the temperature is about the same, right? So if the specific volumes are about the same, for water, it's always about one over a thousand kilograms or meters cubed per kilogram. Then we're going to get that power is going to be M dot times the specific volume times pressure one minus pressure two. And because the job of the pump is to increase the pressure, we expect P2 to be bigger than P1, which means W dot, or the power, is going to be negative. This doesn't mean that if you go to Home Depot to buy a pump, you say you want a pump with negative two horsepower, right? That sign is there for us engineers to be able to say like, oh, it's a negative sign. I know what that means, right? If you have a copy of the textbook and you go through and read how the textbook talks about this, up until this point in the class, they keep this hip to win sign convention. But then at this point, they start to say, oh, the power, it's always the absolute value, right? Because they don't want you to look silly in Home Depot, right? But I like to leave it this way because then I can always get the answer from the first law. I just let the first law take care of the signs, right? So I think I should get a negative pump power because work or power is going in and I remember my hip to win sign convention. So now let's do the math, right? And the units here are gonna get a little tricky too, right? So I have everything that I need because I know the specific volume of the pump and I know the pressure difference of the pump, and I know the mass flow rate of the pump, right? So I had M dot, 10 kilograms per minute, times the specific volume, approximately one over a thousand, times my pressure difference, which is inlet minus outlet. Now, just like when we were doing closed systems, I like to keep my pressures in kilopascals. So even though they gave me the pressure in megapascals here, I turned it to kilopascals because that's kilonewtons per meter squared. And if I multiply that by meters cubed, I'm going to get um, kilonewton meters, right? Which is kilojoules, which is good, right? So here when I do this, I get um, minus 5.21 meters cubed times kilopascals per minute. But I know that meters cubed times kilopascals per minute kilogram. So there should be a kilogram in the denominator here. I missed that because, oh no, the kilograms cancel out, right? But here, if I just uh, left it like this, right? I don't think the kilogram should be there. I'm sorry, right? So here, there's a couple things that I want to do. I might want to turn the minutes to seconds because then if I get kilojoules per second, then I'll get kilowatts. Right, And then uh, if I remember that kilopascals are kilonewtons per meter squared, then meters cubed divided by meters squared is meters. So I get kilonewtons per minute times minutes per 60 seconds. All right, so now I'm going to get 0 0.09 kilowatts. Now, if you remember, um, I think when we did the turbine problem, we were producing power that was on the order of megawatts, I think, on the order of maybe a megawatt. So this is kind of the nice thing about something like a coal power plant. Um, even though there's not, a, you know, coal's not a, the, a great source of power. But one of the reasons it was one of the first things that we did is because it doesn't take that much power to increase the pressure of a liquid. But then when we boil it, 
and we reduce the pressure of steam in a turbine, we get a lot of power out. So your power plant is a net producer of power, which is what you want, right? You want a power plant to produce power, right? That's its job. So that's how we do pump problems. We have to remember when they're ideal pumps, that delta H term becomes specific volume times the change in pressure. Does that make sense? And then check your units. We'll get some practice, but um, really you just got to remember that the hair on the back of your neck should start to stand up when you start talking about pump problems because there's this alternate thing that you're supposed to do. So now we will talk about a heat exchanger problem. Heat exchangers are one of the maybe most interesting or sometimes maybe most difficult problems that we can do because there's different ways to carve them up. For most of the problems that we do, when we ask the question, what's the control volume? It's a pretty straightforward answer. Right, like in the pump. Well, there's one inlet, one outlet. I'll draw the control volume around the wall. But the thing about a heat exchanger is there's a lot of different control volumes that I can draw. Right? Really, there's three. So my first, I hate when it does this, and I don't know why. My first option for the control volume is that I can say that my control volume is going to be the whole heat exchanger. So both the hot side and the cold side. The way this heat exchanger works is that there's refrigerant and we can see it starts at 5 bar and 20% vapor but then it goes to 5 bar and 20 degrees Celsius. I believe that it's being boiled so that it's heating up. I think and we can see that. Let's check out the air side. So the air side starts at one bar. The pressure stays about the same, but the temperature goes down from about 32 degrees to about 22 degrees. The air side is cooling off, which means that heat is moving from the air to the refrigerant. Oops. So that's my heat transfer term. I could draw my control volume around the whole system. That's my first option. I could draw my control volume around only the hot side, which is I'm going to call the air. Or I can draw my control volume only around the refrigerant in the pipe. I hope you'll excuse my uh, less than stellar drawing ability here. I'd say it's only because of the, you know, pad here, but it wouldn't be all that much better on the board, right? So my third option is uh, refrigerant only. So there's three different options here, and the assumptions I'm going to end up making are different. Right now, in this problem, it gives us some uh, some information here. We are not going to do the whole problem. We're just gonna well here because I think this is actually for the next part right when we start to learn about the second law so for now we're not going to think about this equation over here because we haven't learned it yet but i'm going to show you that it's a little different depending on what we do right so for part a let's do conservation of mass right so for conservation of mass we know that this is dm by dt is equal to the sum of m dot in minus the sum of m dot out. If I do the whole thing, 
it is at steady state but if I do the whole thing there's not just one inlet and one outlet there's two inlets and two outlets right because there's one inlet for the air one inlet for the refrigerant one outlet for the air one outlet for the refrigerant so then for the whole thing I still get to cancel out dm by dt so I'm gonna get 0 is equal to the sum of m dot in minus the sum of m dot out that's gonna tell me that it's m dot 1 minus m dot 2 so this is air in this is air out plus m dot 3 minus m dot 4 which is refrigerant in and this one is refrigerant out this is a little tricky without using some kind of intuition right so here I don't know that I can figure out any of these if I just do the whole thing so I could split this up I could think about just the air side and if I just think about the air side now there's one inlet and one outlet right so if there's one inlet and one outlet I'm gonna say steady state one inlet one outlet so for the air side I'm gonna get zero is equal to the mass flow rate air in minus the mass flow rate m dot one minus m dot two so when i cut it up to look at just the air side i see that the mass flow rate at one is equal to the mass flow rate at two i could just call that the mass flow rate of air that part makes sense and the reason for this is because in this particular heat exchanger it's a shell and tube heat exchanger so i have this tube with refrigerant running through it and this shell with air going over that tube and as long as there isn't a leak in the wall that separates the shell from the tube then all the refrigerant stays in the refrigerant side and all the air stays in the air side right we're not crossing the streams right? it's like ghostbusters Right, so I have a mass flow rate of the air and then here on the water or on the refrigerant side I get that zero is equal to because I'm going to make the same assumptions so this is going to be steady state one inlet one outlet so I'm going to get zero is equal to the refrigerant mass flow rate in m dot three minus the refrigerant mass flow rate out m dot four so I'm going to get m dot 3 minus m dot 4 oops, is equal to the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. So I could take these two equations and put them in over here, right? And then what I would get is that 0 is equal to the mass flow rate of air minus the mass flow rate of air plus the mass flow rate of the refrigerant minus the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. Right? And it's true that that equals zero. Unfortunately, if I was only given the mass flow rate of the air, I couldn't find the mass flow rate of the refrigerant from this problem, from doing just this part of the problem. Right? But I do see from conservation of mass that the air side mass flow rate is the same at the inlet and the outlet. And the refrigerant side mass flow rate is the same at the inlet and the outlet. Does that part make sense? Okay, so now what happens if we do conservation of energy? So my advice to you whenever you're doing these kind of problems is to write out the whole thing. dE by dt is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in times H in minus V in squared over 2. Oops, this should be plus plus g z in because it's metric i don't need that gc term i only do that if it's an imperial problem minus 
the sum of m dot out h out plus v out squared over 2 plus g z out i tend to like to stack these things on top of each other cuz then we'll see as i cancel stuff out um i can just draw a line through it so again i have three different options right so here i can say if i do the whole system I'll stay, say that the problem is at steady state. There's no fan blades in here, so I'll say that it's passive. And I'll say that there's no kinetic energy changes and no oops, potential energy changes. So the answer I'm going to get here for the whole system is zero is equal to q dot plus the sum of m dot in h in minus the sum of m dot out h out and now it gets weird this is a heat exchanger right and the job of the heat exchanger is to transfer heat from one fluid to another fluid Right. But the nice thing potentially about drawing this entire, um, you know, this control volume around the whole system is that there is heat that's going to be transferred from the air to the refrigerant. But we're going to assume that around this whole heat exchanger, we wrap a whole lot of insulation. We do that to make sure, or at least to try to ensure, that all the heat that gets lost from the air goes into the refrigerant. So oftentimes, which is not the same thing as saying always, for the entire system, we will often say that this is adiabatic. That this heat transfer term is equal to zero. What that means is that zero is going to be the sum of m dot in h in minus the sum of m dot out h out. Or we have m dot one, which was the air inlet, oops, one, minus m dot two, which was the air outlet, h2, plus m dot three, h3, minus m dot four, h4. But from conservation of mass, we know that m dot one is equal to m dot two, which is equal to m dot air, and m dot three is equal to m dot four, which is equal to the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. So what we could say here is that the mass flow rate of the air times h1 minus h2 plus the mass flow rate of the refrigerant times h3 minus h4 is all equal to zero. So this is one equation that I can get if I draw the whole heat exchanger. This is really good if I don't know a heat transfer term. And often, if I'm trying to find one of the mass flow rates, then this first law is a generally a good strategy. Now, there's three different options we have. So what do I do if I just want to look at the air side? I start with the same equation, right? DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum M dot in H in 
plus v in squared over 2 plus gz in minus the sum m dot out h out plus v out squared over 2 plus gz out. Here, we're going to say for the air side that it's all at steady state. It's still passive, no fan blades. Still no kinetic and potential energy changes. But the cool thing is that if I look at just the air side, there's only one inlet and only one outlet, right? So two of the states I don't have to fix. The trade-off is that Q dot term is going to stick around. So here, Q dot sticks around, but I can cancel out the inlets and the outlets. And now Q dot from the air side is going to be equal to M dot 1 H1 minus M dot 2 H2. But we know from conservation of mass that M dot 1 is equal to M dot 2, which is equal to the mass flow rate of air. So this is going to be M dot H air in minus H air out state 2. So Q dot, when I find it like this, is sort of the opposite of W dot because the signs are opposite. So remember, we've got hi-ho when, we, um, when we're trying to find the W dot. When we're trying to find Q dot, um, this is like ho-hi. And I don't know any um, Disney characters that sing that. So there's no like fancy way to remember this for me or silly way to remember this. But I end up, if I'm just looking at one side of a heat exchanger and I'm trying to find heat transfer, oftentimes it's going to be m dot times h out minus h in. Now, what happens when I just look at the refrigerant side? I'm going to make all the same assumptions that I did on the air side. It's going to be steady state. It's going to be passive. One inlet, one outlet, no kinetic or potential energy changes. And what I'm going to get is that Q dot on the refrigerant side is going to be M dot 3 H3 minus oops H4 times M dot 4. And I know from conservation of mass that M dot 3 is equal to M dot 4, which is equal to just the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. So this is going to be m dot of the refrigerant times h. Oh, I made a mistake here, right? Because this was all on the same side of the equation, right? So in order to keep the q dot, I had to move this stuff. So this was really negative and positive, right? Do you see that? When we did power, we could take this term, which was negative, and move it over here. But now when we're trying to find heat transfer, so I said the right words, but I didn't do the right math. We have to move this stuff over to the other side. So this is going to be H2 minus H1. Right? So when we do heat transfer, right? So power is often going to look like M dot times H in minus H out. Heat transfer, if we're trying to find it from one side of a heat exchanger, is often going to look like M dot times H out minus H in. So the refrigerant side, right? So this is a negative and this is a positive. So this is going to be M dot of the refrigerant times H4 minus H3. So in a problem that asks us for the heat transfer between two sides of a heat exchanger, we probably want to do a first law analysis on only one side of the heat exchanger. Now here's the magic, right? If I come back up here, I see that this 
is the mass flow rate of the air times h in minus h out. Right? That's negative q dot of the air, right? Because we know that q dot of the air is m dot times h out minus h in. And this mass flow rate of the refrigerant is going to be, um, this is also negative q dot of the refrigerant for the same reason, because uh, this was q dot a is equal to this, and q dot of the refrigerant is going to be equal to m dot times h4 minus h3. Do you see how that happened? And because this was all equal to zero, when we come over here, what we see, q dot air is equal to negative q dot of the refrigerant. This is because we forced on the first law this adiabatic condition when we looked at the whole system. So what we did, the assumption that we made up here, when we said this was adiabatic, what we really said was none of the heat that the air is losing goes outside of the control volume. That must mean that all of the heat the air is losing goes into the refrigerant. Another way of saying this is that the magnitude of the heat transfer from the air is equal to the magnitude of the heat transfer from the refrigerant, but the air has heat loss. And the refrigerant has heat in. So in systems where, they're, where the whole system is adiabatic, all the heat that gets lost from one side goes into the other side. Typically, when we'd want to use this whole system will be when we have enough information to fix all these states and maybe we're told the mass flow rate of the air but we're trying to find the mass flow rate of the refrigerant. So if a problem asks you here's a heat exchanger what's the mass flow rate of the refrigerant you might want to look at a first law analysis of the whole system but if a problem says, oh, I have air and the air temperature decreases by 10 degrees, which I think happens in this case, and the mass flow rate of the air is something, then you might want to just look at the air side to find the heat transfer of the air. Then you can say, oh, that's equal to but opposite of the heat transfer for the refrigerant. And then if I know the mass flow rate of the refrigerant, I can find what the change in the enthalpy on the refrigerant side is. Does that generally make sense? Does anyone have a question? If you want to look through a numerical answer as you're going through your um, the problem in uh, you know problems in the textbook where you're trying to do this, you can look through. Um, the notes from lecture 17 and I kind of go through this step by step for this problem where this is sort of the first half of what we did before we got to the second law stuff and it's asking us to find the mass flow rate of the refrigerant and the heat transfer from the air to the refrigerant. So here I could do the first law on the whole system right, and find the mass flow rate of the refrigerant because then I could say that I could use this equation and that's going to let me see that the mass flow rate of the refrigerant is equal to, I can bring all this stuff to the other side, so that's the mass flow rate of the air times H2 minus H1 divided by H3 minus H4. So there I did the first law on the whole system. The second part of this problem asks me to find the heat transfer 
from the air to the refrigerant. So then, because I'm trying to find heat transfer, I put that into here. Because my temperature difference is small, I could also say that the air has constant specific heat. Then I could say m dot times Cp times T2 minus T1. Because the air is cooling, I expect Q dot to be less than zero. So heat exchangers, the tricky thing about heat exchangers is that it really matters what control volume you pick. And as you do more and more of these problems, you'll start to get a sense of which control volume you want to draw when you're trying to answer which type of problem. Typically, if you're trying to find a mass flow rate, you want to look at the whole system. And if you're trying to find a heat transfer rate, you want to look at either the hot side or the cold side. Does anyone have questions? All right, with that, we've been going for about an hour. So we'll take five minutes. Uh, we'll go to 7.36, and then we'll come back for the next part of the lecture. Thanks, everybody. All right, welcome back, everybody. So just a reminder, we've been looking at these open system processes. And one of the reasons we're doing that is because eventually we're going to put a bunch of systems together to look at cool components, right? So when we're trying to do a first law analysis on an open system, we want to draw the control volume. We want to ask what happens to the mass. And then we want to figure out what's going on with conservation of energy. Right, and if we know that a process is possible, if I'm looking at it in real life, let's say I'm working at a nuclear power plant and my supervisor asks me um, to find how much power the turbine is generating, this is enough. These three questions are enough because this is what happens if the process we're talking about is possible. But sometimes we want to know if a particular process is possible. So here I want to walk you through a bit of a thought experiment. So my family and I, um, before this class started, maybe the week before this class started, we went camping for about a week. Uh, something I like to do every summer uh, because I can turn my phone off for a week, which is awesome, and be disconnected. So here we're sort of having a campfire, right? We have some wood, right? We add some heat, which makes the wood burn. We lose some mass because there's smoke that comes out. We lose some heat, right? That's sort of the fun part about a fire, right? Is you can feel the heat from the fire. Now, after my fire is finished, let's say that I could capture all the smoke from the system and I could add back just as much heat as came out of my system, right? So I put all the mass back in I put all the heat back in, it doesn't turn back into a log, right? Same thing is, uh, you know, if I strike a match and let that matchstick burn, and then I unstrike that matchstick, I don't get a fresh match matchstick back, right? But if I only looked at the first law, the first law implies that this is possible, as long as I'm conserving mass and I'm conserving energy. But the universe doesn't quite work that way, right? So we need some other condition to check if a particular process is possible. So the universe has all of these processes that happen, but they kind of have a natural direction to them, right? In the same way that time only flows in one direction, right? Time only ever increases, right? So we're going to introduce a new concept now, and this is maybe one of the more difficult things to talk about conceptually, right? So this is the second law of thermodynamics. And when, the reason we use the second law of thermodynamics is to determine if a particular process is possible or not. 
right? So the second law, another way to think about the second law is that it tells us the natural direction of a process. Am I striking a match and letting it burn? Or am I trying to unstrike a match and get the match stick back, right? One of those things is possible and one of those things is not possible, right? So um, the second law of thermodynamics is kind of why we can't have a perpetual motion machine, right? Um, so let's say you were in Rochester and you're riding your bike to campus and maybe you even found a route that's perfectly flat. You can't just pedal once and coast to your destination, right? Because you're always using energy, right? So the second law sort of tells us that we can't always get what we want, right? Now, one of the things that's tough about the second law is we have to talk about entropy or specific entropy, right? So this I find is always a little bit of a difficult topic to talk about because you can't really see entropy, right? Um, in any natural process, there exists some inherent tendency towards the dissipation of useful energy, right? So entropy is a little bit like the, you know, like a bank. You know how banks make money? Is that on every single transaction, there's a little bit of a fee, right? And the banks try to make lots and lots of transactions and then just add up that little fee for every um, every transaction, right? So even if you're um, trading stocks and uh, whatever portal you're using is telling you that there's no fee, that just means there's no extra fee. There's still a little bit of a difference between the price you pay when you buy it and the price the seller gets when they sell it, right? And that spread, the difference between those two numbers goes to the the people that are making the exchange, right? Because they're not working for free. That's how they make money. And the universe is kind of like that, right? So the, the universe is taking a cut of every energy transaction that we do in the universe, right? People often talk about entropy as some measure of disorder or randomness in a system, right? Oftentimes when you read about entropy, they'll talk about how, you know, your room or maybe my desk here at RIT is, um, you know, it always gets messier unless you're actively cleaning it, right? I, I like this idea of striking or unstriking a match a little bit better than that because I think that's really sort of what the second law is about is there's some natural direction of a process, but it is also sort of related to this idea of randomness, right? It somehow captures the idea that there's losses in a system, right? That something like friction is going to be robbing you of the full potential of whatever you're trying to do, right? Although sometimes friction is good, right? Um, if we didn't have friction between say your bike tire or your car tire in the road, all that would happen is your wheels would spin and, uh, and you'd stay in the same place, right? You'd be like Bambi on ice, right? Like you'd be no traction, right? Now the difference between entropy and energy and mass is that energy and mass are always conserved. Entropy is not conserved. One of the things we'll talk about for the second law is this idea that the entropy of the universe is always increasing as long as you look at the whole universe, right? So um, when I was in high school, maybe it was early in university when I was a freshman or something, I read Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. Honestly, I didn't understand a lot of it. But one of the things it talked about was how entropy is something like time. Time is always increasing in the universe. It's, it's something that only flows in one direction. Right? And the argument is entropy is also kind of like that where it's always increasing. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around exactly what that means. But mathematically, we know that the entropy in the universe is always increasing. When we talk about entropy, we always talk about units when we're using equations. And the units of entropy, capital S, are kilojoules per degree Kelvin, or BTU per degree Rankine. Now, I talked about before how capital letters and lowercase letters um, mean different things in this class. 
but we consistently pick letters that look the same when they're capital letters and lowercase letters. Entropy is no different. Where lowercase s is specific entropy or entropy per unit mass, this is what you'll look up on those tables. And the units for that will be in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin or in BTU per pound mass degree rank. All right, so what's the second law? So the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the entropy in the universe can never decrease. For something to be possible, the entropy of the entire universe, not just your system, but the entire universe must be increasing that whatever energy transaction we do and that's all we're talking about in this thermodynamics class is we're trading one kind of energy for another kind of energy every time we do that the entropy in the universe increases can't even just stay the same has to increase right what that means uh, sort of more physically is that every system has losses and we can't have perpetual motion that's why, um, you know, if you look at a, um, a pendulum, right, you can lift the pendulum up and you can let it go. And it will never come back up to the same height that you, um, that you dropped it from, right, provided there's no other input energy, right? But this is also, you know, my grandparents had a cuckoo clock, right? And that cuckoo clock had, um, you know, brass weights that were shaped like pine cones, right? So one of the things that my great-grandmother did every night right was you know reset those pine cones because that's potential energy in the system right so to keep that pendulum swinging it's taking potential energy from those pine cones as they descend All right so that lets you run the system for longer right so in any system there's this natural process towards dissipation of useful energy Another thing we say, right, this is one of those engineering decoder ring words, right, is that every possible, every process is irreversible, right? That means that if you let that pendulum go, it never comes back up to where you let it go from, right? Or if you were like a skateboarder in a half pipe, right, you never get back up to that same height if you're just passively sitting there on your skateboard, your, your elevation um, at the apex of each sort of loop through the half pipe is the same, right? So irreversibilities are ways that useful energy is dissipated, right? So what are some things that are causing us to lose energy in a particular process, right? And we talked about when we let go of that pendulum, there's some friction in whatever bearing is it's you know, rotating on, right? And that's what makes it so it never comes back up to the same height, right? So mechanically, we think about friction between surfaces, right? If you're an electrical engineer, you might think about electrical resistance. So as you're passing current through a wire, then um, you'll generate some heat, right? Just like friction generates heat, right? So that's um, I squared R. Now, uh, my brother's a chemist, and as you, my understanding, so we're getting, you know, to the fringes of my understanding, right? But I think as you break and reform chemical bonds, then you also get these irreversibilities, right? So you never really get back out all that you put in, right? Which is unfortunate for us, because if you think about the chain of energy transactions from like a fossil fuel, right? That's chemical energy. You have to burn that to turn it into heat energy. Then we turn that heat energy into potential energy that's stored in the form of pressure of steam, right? Then that steam runs over some fan blades to make mechanical energy as a shaft is spinning. Then we make friends with an electrical engineer who puts um, you know, some kind of an electrical generator on there that's turning that spinning shaft into electricity that's running through a bunch of wires, right? So each one of those energy transactions, the universe takes a cut because there's always this uh, dissipation of useful energy, right? So we'll also talk about something in this class that we call a reversible process. 
The reversible process would be if I let go of that pendulum and it comes all the way back up to my hand where I let it go, right? So the thing that we know about a reversible process is that it's not real. It can't happen. But that doesn't mean it's not useful to think about, right? So when we talk about a reversible process, another way to think about this is we're talking about an ideal process, right? This is that case on perfectly flat ground. You know, you pedal twice on your bike and you just keep going forever. Right? Reversible processes do not exist. Right? They're like the tooth fairy. But sometimes we'll think about a process in its ideal form, like the ideal pump we talked about in earlier in the class, um, because it can still give us some idea of what's going on in the real case, right? The irreversible process, right? Um, because knowing the ideal process um, maybe helps us figure out how well we're doing. So we can compare what the real process is compared to the ideal process. This is a way that we can, um, you know, characterize how well our process is working. So if I have that pump, right, and it's doing almost as well, you know, it's increasing that pressure with, I don't know, 5% more power going in than the ideal case, Maybe that's not that bad, right? But if it's 50% more power than the ideal case, maybe that means I need a new pump, right? Or I got to hire an engineer to design me a new pump, right? So we can talk about ideal versus real. Remember, ideal is reversible and real is irreversible, right? In a reversible or ideal processes, there are no irreversibilities. It's a cartoon of the real world. We're saying things like there are, there is no friction in the process, right? If you have an ideal process or an irreversible process, you're at the limit of possibility, right? So we know that every process generates entropy in the universe. So the limit of what's possible, the ideal case, is the case where you're not generating entropy. You're not destroying en en entropy, but your entropy generation is zero, right? So zero entropy generation. But in a real process where there are irreversibilities like friction or that joule heating from pushing current through a wire, right? There, the entropy generation is positive. So the entropy in the universe, the entropy we're generating from doing whatever process we're doing is positive. We're generating entropy. So that's great, right? If I could figure out what the entropy generation is. Right? But thankfully, just like for conservation of mass and conservation of energy, we have an equation for this. Right? And our equation is going to be the second law. But unlike conservation of mass and the first law, which are our first sort of cornerstone equations, entropy is not conserved. Entropy is created by everything we do. So if I was writing the second law of thermodynamics in an elapsed time format, right? This is a hint that we're eventually we're going to get the rate equations. It would look like this, that the change in the energy in the system, or delta S, has got something to do with the heat transfer and some kind of characteristic temperature some entropy that comes in with the mass and goes out with the mass, plus this sigma term. And that sigma term is the entropy generation, right? So we know for real processes, we need this entropy generation term to be positive, right? So what are the units? Delta S, remember entropy is measured in kilojoules per kilogram. Right, so this, or kilojoules per degree Kelvin, I'm sorry. Right, so this first term, the entropy transfer that's related to heat is Q, which is a heat transfer term in kilojoules, divided by temperature, which has to be in Kelvin or Rankine. Remember, 
anytime you see an equation that's got temperature and not change in temperature means that we have to use absolute temperatures. Got to be Kelvin or Rankine. Mass, which is in kilograms, times specific entropy, which is in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So if I cancel out the kilograms, I get kilojoules per Kelvin. That's good. Right? And this must also mean that my entropy generation term is also in the units of entropy, or kilojoules per Kelvin. Right? So what does this all mean? Delta S, right? Remember, this is like delta M when we were talking about conservation of mass. This is if my system has something in it over time, the change in the entropy that's in my system might be different, right? So if I increase the amount of water that's in my system versus air, then maybe my entropy changes. I may be adding or losing heat, and there's entropy that gets transferred into the system because of that. There may be some mass coming in or going out that might be taking entropy with it. And then there's this entropy produced. This is the entropy produced in the entire universe because of this transaction that we're doing. Entropy is not conserved because of this last term. This last term is how much entropy was generated because of this energy transfer that we did in our process. Right, so any process that violates the second law of thermodynamics can't happen, right? So how does a process violate the second law, right? So we know from what we've done so far that for a process to work, we have to conserve mass and conserve energy, right? But we also must generate entropy. So when I'm doing the math, right, that means that my sigma term has to be positive because every real process generates entropy. If I have an ideal process, this is the equivalent of a perpetual motion machine. That's that bike that you pedal once and it keeps going forever, even if you're on flat ground. Right? The limit of what's possible is if this entropy generation term is zero. If you, if you ever get sigma to be negative, then for sure that's not possible. Even that ideal case is not possible, but at least it's maybe useful in terms of sort of checking to see the limit of what's possible. Right? But um, if, it, if that value is ever negative, for sure that process is not possible. Or at least as humans, we have absolutely no evidence that a process can happen when we're not generating entropy completely, right? When we look at, when, when we draw the control volume big enough, when we think about the whole universe. So just like all the other elapsed time formats, we can change this into a rate equation by taking all these terms, dividing by delta T and letting delta T go to zero, or at least to some infinitesimally small process or value, right? And then this delta S term, right? That was the entropy stored in my system becomes this differential term dS by dt. My Q becomes a Q dot. So now this is the rate of heat transfer going into my system. It's got the same sign as the first law. Heat in is positive. Heat out is negative. Divided by still temperature of the surroundings. This part's going to be important that it's not the temperature... It's like the temperature of the place we're hand transferring heat to or where we're receiving heat from. This is sort of how we put the rest of the universe into our control volume or into our analysis. And then we look at entropy that's associated with mass flow rates coming in, mass flow rates going out, and now we have an entropy generation rate. How fast is the entropy in the universe increasing? Right, so... If we think about this, what does each term mean? The first term is how much entropy am I storing or depleting in my system? Right? When we're at steady state, that one's going to go to zero. right? Because all these d anything by dt terms, when we're at steady state, which in this class we always will be, 
that term will go to zero. This is the rate at which entropy is entering the control volume because of heat transfer. This is the rate at which entropy is entering the control volume because of the mass flow. The rate at which entropy is leaving the system because of the mass flow. And then there's this new part, because entropy is not conserved, there's this rate at which entropy is being created because of this process. Right, so when we think about violating the second law, we're always thinking about this entropy generation rate term, right? So for any real process, the entropy in the universe must be increasing, right? Which means the slope, if we were drawing entropy over time, must be positive, right? So this sigma dot term for a real process that can happen in the universe that we live in must be positive. The limit of what's possible is this ideal case where sigma dot is equal to zero. This is that perpetual motion machine. It's not possible, but it's kind of the limit of what's possible. And then if we ever do a problem in sigma dot, this entropy generation rate is negative, we know that that process cannot happen. Right? So this is the test. If you get a question and it says, is this process possible? One of the ways that we can answer that is by doing a second law analysis and trying to solve for sigma dot, or at least trying to figure out what the sign might be. Okay, so up until this point, I've kind of been holding out on you because we've been drawing temperature versus specific volume or temperature versus volume diagram. Now, the rules are always going to be the same, but from now on, when we have temperature on the vertical axis, we're going to be interested in temperature versus specific entropy diagrams, or TS diagrams. And there's a physical reason for this, right? Just like, remember, when we were doing um, first law analyses of closed systems, PV diagrams were nice because we knew that the work was the area under the curve. Right? We knew something physical just by looking at the curve. And that's going to be true for TS diagrams too. So oftentimes, when we think about these uh, heat engines that we're going to be studying, we're interested in things like turbines and pumps. If I do a second law analysis on a turbine, I'm often going to make the assumptions that it's at steady state, that it's got one inlet and one outlet, and that it's adiabatic, that the heat transfer rate might as well be zero. If it was an ideal turbine, the other thing that I know is that sigma dot goes to zero. That's the limit of what's possible. You can't actually get to this ideal turbine, but it's the first process that's impossible, right, is this ideal case where sigma dot is equal to zero. Now, there's two ways this can happen, right? So if we look through the second law, it tells us that we get zero is equal to m dot times s in minus s out. This can happen if there's no mass flow rate going through the turbine. But that's like the super boring case because nothing is happening. The other way this ideal turbine can exist is if the change, well, it can't actually exist, but mathematically we could describe it, if the change in entropy was zero. Right? So this is kind of cool because now we know that in this ideal turbine case, if we can make all the assumptions we have here, S in is equal to S out. We call this an isentropic process. It's another one of those definition words, right? Engineering decoder ring kind of words. If it's an ideal, or if it's a real turbine, this should say uh, real turbine over here. If it's a real turbine, we make almost all the same assumptions, except that it's not ideal. So the entropy generation rate must 
be greater than zero. I can't cancel it out. So I find for the real turbine, m dot times s out minus s in must be positive, which means that the entropy at the outlet of the turbine has to be bigger than the entropy at the inlet of the turbine. So if I was drawing an ideal in a real turbine on a TS diagram, my ideal turbine would have no change in entropy. Across this turbine, what we're doing is we're reducing the pressure of the fluid. So we're moving from this high pressure line to this low pressure line. And if it's an ideal turbine, delta S is equal to zero. So this ideal process will mark as the ideal or isentropic outlet here to S is vertically below state one because there's no change in the specific entropy for the ideal turbine if we can make all those other assumptions. But for the real turbine, if we make all those same assumptions, the actual outlet the entropy has to be bigger than S1. So I know that this line in the real process can't be vertically down. It has to be down and to the right. So just by looking at a TS diagram, if I have an ideal turbine, it's a vertical line down. But a real turbine goes down and to the right. Does that part make sense? We can do a very similar analysis with pumps. The ideal pump, we make all the same assumptions as we did with the ideal turbine. That it's steady state, one inlet, one outlet, adiabatic, and ideal. So sigma dot goes to zero. And that tells us, in the exciting case where the system's not off, that the specific entropy at the inlet is equal to the specific entropy at the outlet. But in the real case, steady state, one inlet, one outlet, adiabatic, but sigma dot is positive, which must mean, again, that specific entropy at the outlet is bigger than specific entropy at the inlet. Remember, pumps take liquid in and put liquid out, but they increase the pressure. So if I was going kind of around and around here, remember my turbine went from up here to down here, my ideal pump is going to be a vertical line up because the entropy doesn't change, right? Just like, remember when we were fixing states in that closed rigid container and the specific volume didn't change and that let us fix that other state? I can do the same thing here if I know that that specific entropy doesn't change. Right? But the real pump has to go up and to the right because the entropy is increasing. Right, So this brings us to this next question. Now, when it was my first time, so this was the very first class that I taught when I started here at RIT, and I was a little worried, and uh, my brother, who's a couple years older than me, he's a professor at uh, Binghamton University, uh, he, also here in upstate New York. And I was talking to him and I was like, oh, I'm a little worried. We're getting close to having to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. And the only thing that I really know for sure is that the entropy of the universe always increases. And my brother looked at me and he said, well, that's not true. Because if I look here, I could have a process, certainly, where I start at saturated vapor, steam, and I cool it down to liquid, right? And it's pretty clear from this TS diagram that T is decreasing there. Now, what I told my brother is, yes, it's true that you can condense liquid. Like, I mean, we've all seen that happening, right? Like the dew on your window in the, you know, maybe in the fall, right? But you have to think about the whole universe. 
The second law doesn't tell you that the entropy in your system can't decrease. Certainly the entropy of water decreases when it condenses, and that's allowable. But it's the entropy of the universe that doesn't decrease. So we're going to see, after our next break, what happens when the Q dot term is not equal to zero, right? So in this discussion, turbines and pumps are kind of nice to do with the second law because we cancel out that Q dot term. And we'll see when we start to talk about the second law for things like heat exchangers that uh, it's that Q dot term that's going to maybe cause us some problems. So we'll take a break for five minutes. We'll come back at 8.15 and we'll start to talk about what happens when the heat transfer rate is not equal to zero. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we're gonna start to talk about how we use the second law when there's heat transfer involved. Right, so the second law, right, it tells us that um, we can't get perpetual motion. Right? We can't always get what we want. We talked about how normally there's three questions that we have for open systems. Where's the control volume? What happens to the mass? What happens to the energy? But if we're trying to do something that maybe hasn't ever been done before, we might want to see, is the process we're talking about possible? Right? And that's why we might want to use the second law of thermodynamics. Right? So we check the second law by taking the math and trying to calculate a value for this entropy generation rate term, or sigma dot. If a process is real, if it can actually happen in the universe, then the entropy generation rate is possible. If it's an ideal process, sigma dot, or this entropy generation rate, is zero. This is not possible, but it's kind of the limit of what we could do. And if we're destroying entropy, then that means it's not possible, right? So if you get a problem and it asks you, is this thing possible? One of the things you can do is a second law analysis, and if you get sigma dot is negative, you know your process is not possible. Right, so um, what about when sigma dot is not, or when Q dot, when there is heat transfer, right? So we talked about turbines and pumps, and how we can see if they're vertical, they're ideal, but if they're slanted to the right, then that means on a TS diagram, then that means that they're real, right? But what about if there's a heat transfer term? I can look in the system if I'm boiling water, right? If I'm moving from this subcooled liquid and I'm adding heat, here S is increasing. So maybe I'm not as concerned about that, right? But like I said, when I started talking about sort of my, um, my fear of teaching the second law, right, to my brother, he was saying, well, I remember in physical chemistry, um, when you have a condensation reaction, right, when you're cooling steam into a liquid, entropy decreases. And that's true. But the second law doesn't tell us that delta S can't be zero. Instead, it tells us that sigma dot, or the entropy generation rate, can't be negative. So how do we deal with cases when Q dot is not equal to zero, particularly if uh, Q dot is negative, so if I'm losing heat. Although we'll see, it's kind of the same thing if we're gaining heat, right? Um, this happens all the time in what we call a condenser, something that's condensing liquids, right? So here's a second law example for a condenser. We have mass coming in at state three and going out at state four. We're told that the mass flow rate through the system is one kilogram per second, which is good, makes the math easier. We're also told something T infinity, right? This is a notation that we often use from heat transfer, right? Now, if you think about that Q dot term in the second law, it's the heat transfer rate over some temperature. I know that temperature has to be an absolute temperature because it's not delta T. 
But in the equations, at least when I write them down, I usually write T of the surroundings, the place where we're transferring heat to or getting heat from. I think it's actually supposed to be temperature at the boundary of your control volume, but we often don't necessarily know that, right? But it's not a temperature inside my control volume, right? T infinity um, is notation we use from heat transfer. What it means is... I, I like to cook, right? Um, I don't know if anybody uses a cast iron skillet, but I make eggs most mornings on cast iron skillets. And one of the things that I know is that if you want your eggs not to stick to the pan, you have to turn it on and let it heat up for like five minutes, right? Now, if you think about that, you have a pan that's hot, right? And I have my hand. When my hand is some distance away from the pan, it's the same temperature as most of the air, right? But as I get closer and closer to the pan, without touching it, that wouldn't be a great idea, I can start to feel the heat from the pan, right? The temperature as I get close to that pan increases the temperature of the air. T infinity just means we're far enough away from that pan that the temperature of the pan is not affecting the temperature of the air anymore, right? Um, another example, if you just sitting in your room right now, right? Your temperature is probably higher than the temperature of the air around you. So there's some layer of air around you that's being heated up by your face, right? But if you go far enough away, you know, you get past that sort of slice of air where the temperature is is increased because you're hotter than the environment right um so this will be this uh t infinity the temperature when you're far enough away from whatever you're talking about that this pan or whatever you're talking about is not affecting that temperature right in this case we're going to say that the pressure drop across this tube is small enough we don't have to think about it but we start at steam and we end at liquid. This is that condensation reaction my brother was talking about, right? Although, you know, as mechanical engineers, we don't necessarily talk about them as reactions, right? This is this condensation process, right? Going from all steam to all liquid. Is the process possible, right? So the first thing we want to do is we draw our control volume, right? Okay, my control volume is this tube. Right? I'm going to start with conservation of mass. Right? So dm by dt is equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates coming in minus the sum of all the mass flow rates going out. Right? So I've got to start making assumptions. Right? The first assumption we're always going to make in this class, except for maybe one problem in conservation of mass homework, right? is that it's at steady state. So it's been running long enough that everything's kind of settled out. And in this particular tube that has steam coming in one side and liquid going out the other side, there's only one inlet and only one outlet. So that means this mass flow rate they gave me, I might think, oh, well, what's the subscript? Is this m.2 or m.3 or m.in or m.out? It actually doesn't matter. There's only one mass flow rate. Right? So it wasn't terrible that they didn't give me a subscript in this particular problem for the mass flow rate. That's our first step. Our second step is we want to do conservation of energy. Right? Again, I'm going to start with the symbolic solution because the process for the symbolic solution is almost always the same. I think about my process. Right? I'm going to say, oh, this is at steady state. There's only one inlet, one outlet. I made those two assumptions already in conservation of mass. It's the same control volume, so I can make those again. There's no fan blades inside my tube here, right? So I'm going to say that this work done inside the control volume is equal to zero. I'm going to say that the elevation of the inlet and outlet are about the same, right? No potential energy change. That the kinetic energy here is about the same, right? And what I'm going to get is this assumption that hopefully starts to become familiar to me, that if I'm trying to find heat transfer or heat transfer rates, Q dot, I'll often get an equation that m dot is equal to h out minus h in. 
Okay, that's good. I can find heat transfer, right? I know the mass flow rate, but I don't know H out and I don't know H in. So what am I supposed to do? I got to fix the states. And to fix the states, the first question is, whenever I have an equation and I'm trying to find delta H or delta U or now delta S, the question that I ask myself is, what's the fluid? In this case, because it's condensing, it's water or something like it. It happens to actually be water, right? So going out, I have pure liquid, saturated liquid. And coming in, I have saturated vapor, right? So now we can go by and fix the states, right? So I know my pressure stays constant, or at least I'm told that my pressure stays constant at 0.1 megapascals or about one bar. Right, so the temperature is going to stay about constant, just under 100 degrees. And if I was drawing this now on a TS diagram, which the diagram follows all the same rules as a TV diagram. I've just written S on the x-axis. But I start off on my saturated vapor line, and I'm moving at constant pressure to my saturated liquid line. If I'm trying to find state two, I know the pressure and I know the quality. I can always fix a state when I know pressure and quality. Because I know the pressure, I'm going to go to table A3. It's got nice round pressures here on the left. It told me it was 0.1 megapascals, right? That's 0.1 times 1,000 kilopascals or 100 kilopascals, which is one bar. Right? So if, it, if the problem just asked me the temperature, I could find that here. Right? But instead, I want to find H in and H out. Right? But H in is saturated vapor. So if I was trying to fix state 2, I would take this for H2. Now, I know I'm going to have to do the second law, so I'm going to have to find S2 as well. But this is nice. There's no interpolation. Right? So it's HG going in all right so i can put those numbers in my state table that h2 is 2675.5 s2 that's this is in kilojoules per kilogram s2 is 7.36 ish kilojoules per kilogram kelvin does everybody get how we pulled those off the table I will assume since there's no questions here. We're going to come out at saturated liquid. This one's also nice because we don't have to do any interpolation. And it's even the same row of the table because the pressure stays the same. Right? So now we're just do, talking about the liquid state where the quality is equal to zero. Right? So now I get HF is much lower, right? So we went from 2675.5 down to 417.46, right? So the energy in the fluid is a lot less, right? The specific enthalpy went down, right? The difference here, this is why it takes a lot of heat to boil water, right? And we also see that the specific entropy went down, which is nice because when we're drawing our TS diagram, this is what we think should happen, right? Because we're moving from right to left. We're moving to the left. Right? So we think that the specific entropy is decreasing. And that's kind of the question that we have is, well, how can the entropy in the universe be increasing when the entropy of the liquid is going down? Right? So I pull those two numbers off the table too. So this would be, how do I find the heat transfer? Right? Now I have enough information, I can find the heat transfer rate. M dot times H3 minus H2. Right, so it's one kilogram per second. That's nice. The math works out. Times delta H. Remember, this is H out minus H in. H out is 417.46 minus 2675.5. Right, the kilograms here are going to cancel. So we'll get kilojoules per second or kilowatts. I get a negative heat transfer, which makes sense because to go from steam to liquid at the same pressure, I must be losing heat. I know that heat in is positive, but I'm losing heat here, so I get a negative value. 
I don't know if the magnitude makes sense, but I get the right units. This is energy per unit time or kilowatts. And the sign is right. So I feel pretty good about my Q dot value. Now I come to the second law. Is this process possible? We see that the specific entropy of the liquid is decreasing. But the second law doesn't actually care. Well, it cares because it's part of the equation. But the limiting factor, the thing that we're actually interested in, is what happens to sigma dot, right? So here, it's more complicated when we ask, is the process possible, than a turbine or a pump where Q dot is equal to zero, right? So we're going to start with the base level of the second law of thermodynamics. We're going to use the rate equation because it's an open system. We've already said that this system is at steady state. We know that we have one inlet and one outlet. And unfortunately, unlike the turbine and the pump, it's not adiabatic. Oftentimes when I'm doing second law analyses, I want to cross out this Q dot term because it makes my life easier. But we can't do that here because there is actually a heat transfer rate. Right? So now I get the equation when I manipulate this and I'm solving for Q dot or for sigma dot, right? This entropy generation rate. So I have to move this Q dot over T to the left-hand side of my equation, right? So this is negative Q dot now over temperature of the surroundings. And I got to move this M dot, right? The conservation of mass told me, well, M dot in and M dot out are the same. So I can just say M dot. And this looks like S in minus S out over here, but I got to move it to the other side of the equation. So it becomes S out minus S in. Does the manipulation of the equation make sense? This is one of the things, one of the things if you're doing this too fast that I've seen people do on, on examinations that I've done myself sometimes when I'm just working on the board is um, I don't flip the sign of this, right? So just be careful. Um, Right? I always tell my kids, you know, they're a little old for this now, but, uh, you know, we used to watch Dora when my girls were younger, right? And Dora says, stop and think, right? So sometimes this algebra algebraic manipulation, which I know you know how to do, and you've done like a billion times in your life, um, when you're going fast in the exam, um, it's easy to mess up. Speaking of Dora, um, I don't know, maybe six months ago or a year ago, we watched the like live action Dora movie, which I thought was kind of not going to be good, but it's actually pretty funny, especially if you grew up watching the cartoon or whatever. Check it out. Another thing we watched um, last weekend, my kids from the library got this movie called Spies in Disguise. It's like an animated movie. It's got Will Smith in it, and it's pretty funny. So if you get a chance, I thought it was pretty good. All right, so this is what the second law told me, right? And it's not just as simple now as saying that sigma dot is equal to mass flow rate times delta s which is too bad because i liked that formulation but now we got to worry about this heat transfer term and there's a couple of things that can screw me up about this heat transfer term the first is i got to remember that q dot has the same sign as it has in the first law the second thing that i have to remember is that this temperature is not a temperature difference so I have to use Calvin if it's metric or Rankine if it's imperial. Finally, this temperature, if I have a choice, is not the temperature inside my control volume. It's the temperature of the part of the universe that I'm communicating with, right? So it's the temperature outside my control volume. Or if you read the textbook, it might say the temperature of the boundary. So a couple of things that I see people often make mistakes with, right? The other thing you can make mistakes is not doing the algebra carefully and not flipping this to S out minus S in, right? But we see that this term here, the M dot term, the entropy that's going with the mass flow rate, um, it's going to be negative. So for this part here, this sigma dot to be positive, we need this first term. First, it's got to be positive, right? And it's got to be higher magnitude than the second term. Right? Now, the first piece of good news, as long as I do this right, 
is that I remember that Q dot is negative, right? So here I have negative, like negative one times Q dot, but Q dot is negative. So the good news is when I just look at this, I'm starting to put the numbers in and I see, oh, this first term is going to be positive. So that means I got a chance for this thing to be positive, right? Um, absolute temperatures, the reason that they're absolute temperatures is that the lowest possible temperature you can be is zero. That means an absolute temperature can neg never be a negative number. The absolute temperature must be positive, right? And here you can see why you need to use absolute temperatures here. You will get a very different answer if you have zero degrees Celsius versus if you have 273 degrees Kelvin, right? So please remember, this is one thing that people often make mistakes in in exams. If you have any kind of equation where it's a single temperature and not a delta T, you have to use absolute temperature. When I'm doing this, I like to not put everything into my calculator at once, because as I've said before, I'm really good at putting things in my calculator wrong, right? And once I start putting numbers into my equation, I put in units and I check the units out, right? Because otherwise I can't see if I'm adding, you know, like kilojoules to, to watts or, you know, kilojoules to joules, right? Even then it's kind of this, the right quantity, but not the right unit. So here I've got kilowatts per Kelvin in my first term. I can cancel the kilojoules here. So I got kilojoules per second Kelvin. And that's good because kilojoules per second is kilowatts, right? So this is kilowatts per Kelvin. So I can just add these things up. I don't have to do any kind of weird um, math here to get the units right. I like to evaluate these two terms separately because it lets me see right off the bat if my numbers make sense. Plus, if I end up getting a negative number here, I'm always a little suspicious when if the answer to the question is no, that thing is not possible. I'm always a little suspicious. So I like to have these two things written down separately. And I see that I have 7.2 kilowatts per Kelvin minus 6.1, and I get a positive number. So that's good. That means this process is possible. Right, so I feel pretty good about that answer, right? I went right from the beginning. I drew my control volume. I did conservation of mass. I did conservation of energy. That gave me Q dot, which I needed for the second law here because it's not an adiabatic process. And then I needed to fix the states to find the H's and the S's at the inlets and the outlets. If I can ever draw a control volume to eliminate this heat transfer term in a second law problem, I'm probably going to try to do it, right? There would be a trade-off when we looked at the heat exchanger problem in conservation of energy, right? If I drew the whole control volume as my, if I drew the whole heat exchanger as my control volume, remember the magic that happened there was that even though heat was going from my air to my refrigerant, we canceled out that heat transfer term because the heat transfer, that squiggly line for heat transfer, didn't cross the boundary. We said all the heat that left the air went into the refrigerant, and all, since all of that was in my control volume, I didn't have to have a heat transfer term. Sometimes, if I can, usually if I can, I would like to do that here. The downside is I would have two mass flow rate terms and four specific entropy terms that I'd have to figure out. The upshot though, is that I don't have to deal with this heat transfer rate term. And that heat transfer rate term is the term that when people make mistakes on these kind of problems, it's usually the heat transfer term. Either they mess up the sign of the heat transfer or they use Celsius or Fahrenheit or when given an option for different temperatures, they take the temperature inside the control volume and not either the boundary or the temperature outside the control volume. So, you know, I don't want you to be afraid of this term because it's not that hard to deal with. But if you can eliminate this term, you end up eliminating a lot of potential 
errors that you can make. So for me, if I can get rid of that term, I'm probably going to do it. So that tells us how we can deal with the second law if there's a heat transfer term, right? And here we can see, even though the entropy of the water in our system was decreasing, the entropy of the universe still increased. The reason for that is that, yes, we cool down the water, and as something cools, its entropy increases. But as one thing cools, another thing is heating up. So the entropy of that other thing is increasing. What this means is the second law says, if you're cooling something down and reducing the entropy, the entropy of that thing that you're heating up is going up by more than the entropy that's reduced in, in this case, the condensing liquid. Now we don't have the entropy of, say, air that's being used to cool this particular system. Instead, we have this term, this heat transfer over the temperature term, and that's kind of how are we communicating with the rest of the universe. Does anybody have questions about this? I know it can be kind of a lot to think about this second law stuff. But we're really trying to break it down into some kind of a common process that we can use to answer the question, is this thing possible? So we need to try to find whether or not sigma dot is greater than zero. I don't see any questions here. So that's one way to think about the second law, but it's not the only way to think about the second law. Right? So we were looking at, in this case, this is like a very simple diagram of sort of the basic components you would need for something like a coal-fired power plant or a nuclear power plant. Right? And we were just looking at the condenser. But... If we widen out our control volume, if we look at more of the condenser and instead look at the whole system, it goes from being an open system with mass moving into and out of the condenser to a closed system where the whole system is a heat engine. Right? And the energy transaction we're doing in a heat engine is we're taking heat in and putting work out. Right? This is like the classic locomotive, right? You got somebody shoveling coal into the boiler, and that makes the wheels move, right? With some stuff in between. Right? So this is a heat engine because we're turning heat into work. It's the genesis of the word thermodynamics. There's heat coming in because maybe we're burning coal or we're performing some kind of nuclear reaction. And there's some kind of net work coming out here because the turbine is producing power. But the pump requires power, right? So there's a net power here, right? You don't have much of a power plant if you're consuming more power in the pump than you're putting out in the turbine, right? So this is kind of like the genesis of thermodynamics, right? Maybe these names, or at least the last names here, sound familiar to you, like Thomas Calvin, the person we named temperature after, Max Planck. So maybe you've heard about... Um, you know, the Planck's constant, right? So it's pretty, like, it's always annoying if you go and, like, you read the, like, Wikipedia articles of these people because it's sort of like invented thermodynamics, right? And then, and then like, it's like they also end up, like, playing cello in the Scottish Philharmonic Orchestra or something, right? Like, they just seem to do everything. And it's like, I'm just trying to struggle to teach a heat transfer class, right? Or a thermodynamics class, right? But what they said, right, when they looked at these heat engines, what they told us is that it's not possible to make a device that operates on a cycle. What that means is it runs for a long period of time with no other effect than the production of work and the transfer of heat from a single body. I don't like these words, right? I find it's not super clear, so I like to draw a picture. What this means is that you can't make a heat engine that doesn't have a heat sink. So I can't burn coal or maybe gasoline and turn all that heat into work. Instead, I need to cool my engine down. I hope you've never been in this situation. 
but you may have seen somebody on the side of the road, right, often the highway, who's, you know, pouring a water bottle on her engine because it overheated, right? You need to cool the engine down or the engine will get up to the same temperature that you're burning your fuel at. You don't want that to happen. So that's why we have a radiator in the front of our car. Its job is to cool the engine off, right? So what Calvin and Planck said is, yeah, you can take inlet heat and turn it into work, but you have to cool the engine down. And if we look at this from a first law perspective, it's there's heat going in, and that's got to equal the work going out and the heat going out. Unfortunately, what this means is I can't turn all the heat that I'm putting in into work, right? Then I have lost. Right, so for a heat engine, you have your heat is coming in. Net heat is positive, right? Net work is also positive, right? Um, but because you have waste heat, it means that not all the heat that you put in turned into work. Right? If we looked at this as a rate balance, right? there's no mass flow rate in, no mass flow rate out, because we've zoomed out far enough that this is a closed system that sort of encompasses all these four parts. Right? And that means that the heat rate in, the net heat is equal to the net work. Right? But the net heat is the heat in plus the heat out, which is negative. And that's going to be the net work. So yeah, I can turn heat into work, but I can't turn all the heat into work. Or maybe I can for some short amount of time until I overheat my engine and the whole thing breaks. All right, so one of the ways we write this is that W dot net is equal to Q dot in minus Q dot out. This is sort of the terminology the textbook uses. But really, in order to write it this way, you have to have absolute values around both of these heat transfer. Otherwise, it would be Q dot in plus Q dot out, but Q dot out would be negative. So now we can talk about how well our engines perform. What we do is for all of these, all of these different machines, we'll talk about some kind of parameter that tells us how well they run. That parameter, in this case called thermal efficiency, will always be, what's the energy that we want, the energy benefit, divided by the energy cost? So here, our energy benefit from this heat engine is the power, the mechanical power that's produced by the engine, the net power or the net work. The energy cost is not the net heat, because then this would always be equal to one. Instead, it's the heat that we have to put in, right? What's all the heat that we got from burning the coal or the natural gas or the gasoline that we put into the system? Another way that I can write this is the heat rate in or the magnitude of the heat rate in minus the magnitude of the heat rate out divided by the heat rate in because the net power is equal to the heat rate in or the magnitude of the heat rate in minus the magnitude of the heat rate out. Which is 1 minus q dot out over q dot in. Again, assuming the heat rate terms are absolute values. Now, maybe you've heard of this term and maybe you haven't. Either way is okay. But we have this thing that we call a Carnot heat engine. Carnot is a fancy word for ideal. If you have a Carnot engine or an ideal engine, we can replace any ratio of heat transfer rates or heat transfer terms with a ratio of temperatures. What it's saying is because there's no resistance between the hot place and the cold place, right? But you won't really learn about that until you take heat transfer. So now we can talk about this ideal thermal efficiency, the biggest efficiency we could possibly get would be 1 minus T out over T in. Notice that neither of the temperature terms in this equation are temperature differences, which means 
that the temperatures in this equation have to be either Kelvin or Rankine, right? And just to check the units, like we like to do in equations, is this is we have one dimensionless term, which is an efficiency, which will run between 0 and 1, or if you'd like to multiply by 100%, 0% and 100%. And we have 1, which has no units, and Calvin over Calvin, or Rankine over Rankine, which is also dimensionless. So that's our thermal efficiency. We know that the ideal heat engine works better than the real heat engine. That's why it's ideal. Right? So it must have, the ideal engine has to have better efficiency than the real engine. This is another way that you can answer the question, is this process possible? Because you might have, they might tell you, you stayed up late watching some infomercial about power plants for some reason, and they told you that the thermal efficiency is 68%. But you know that their inlet and outlet temperatures are X and Y. Is it possible? So you can see, oh, if the actual thermal efficiency is less than the ideal thermal efficiency, then it's possible. Right? You don't know if it's true, but you can't prove that it's not. But if someone is reporting an actual thermal efficiency that's bigger than the ideal thermal efficiency, which you can think of as the maximum thermal efficiency, then they must be lying or at least not know what they're talking about. So here's just a simple example. Right, so we have this heat engine. We know that the temperature of the hot place is 100 degrees, 150 degrees Celsius, and the cold place is 50 degrees Celsius. We know that there's 100 kilowatts of heat coming in. What's the maximum power that we could generate from this system? So from here, right, usually there's a tip-off. This is sort of like the way the textbook draws these kind of heat engines, right, is a block with a circle in it, right? And it's communicating between a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir, a heat source and a heat sink, right? And we can say that our maximum thermal efficiency is going to be 1 minus T cold over T hot, right? Now, one of the things, if this was a multiple choice question and people were going to mess it up, they would just put in the temperatures in Celsius. But you're not going to make that mistake, right? You're going to say, oh, all of these thermal efficiency problems, right? Your spidey sense is tingling. I got to turn those temperatures into Calvin or Rankine, right? There, I can see that I can only turn for every one kilowatt of heat, I get 0.24 kilowatts of work, right? Or that... If my inlet heat rate is 100 kilowatts, my maximum power is 24 kilowatts. This is the sad part about heat engines. Um, when you think about the efficiency like this, we lose a lot of heat. Uh, particularly as we start to talk about nuclear power plants and, um, and coal-fired power plants, because we have to cool them off, it means we have to condense liquid. And just like it takes a lot of heat to boil water, you have to remove a lot of heat to condense water. And this cycle, while it was the first kind of cycle that we figured out, and it works well, you lose a lot of heat. So you'd like to be able to employ lots of different um, strategies to improve this efficiency so that for every bit of heat that you're putting in, you're getting more than just 24% of power back out. So most of the cycles, the sort of thermodynamic devices we're going to think about are heat engines where we're putting heat in and we're getting work out. But we're also going to end up talking about things like refrigerators or um, air conditioners or heat pumps. And then we can think about the second law in the terms that Rudolf Clausius gave us, right? And what he said was, it's not possible to construct a device that operates on a cycle with the sole effect of transferring heat from a colder body to a hotter body. 
Right? It is possible to make it seem like we're sort of bending the universe to our will here, where it looks like we're removing heat from the freezer, the air in the freezer, and dumping that heat to the air behind the fridge, right, which is hotter. The way we do that is we build a machine that's got a cold side that's colder than the freezer and a hot side that's hotter than the air behind the freezer. You can't do this and produce power at the same time, even though the first law sort of implies that you can. Right? As I'm sure you know, your freezer or your refrigerator or your air conditioner don't work very well unless you plug them in. So what Clausius tells us is to make this device that looks like it's transferring heat in the wrong direction, you have to add power or some kind of energy, right? But often mechanical power. Now we have a couple of different device types that work like this. And the difference is only about your perspective. So if you have a heat pump, this is sort of like the equivalent of a furnace. Now, if you've lived in Rochester your whole life, or I grew up in Canada, you probably don't have experience with heat pumps as heating devices um, because our temperature swings between the winter and the summer are really big, right? So you'll often have something like a gas, right? But in places where the temperatures are more moderate, you'll often have a heat pump and an air conditioner and they heat your house and cool your house by just changing some of the processes that are going on inside, right? So in a heat pump, you're sitting in the hot space. And the thing you're interested in is how much heat is going into the hot space, right? So a heat pump is transferring energy from a low temperature, maybe that's outside in the winter, to a place that has a high temperature, like inside of your house. Clausius tells us we can't have a machine like this unless we're putting some kind of energy, usually mechanical power, into the system. Right? So now we don't have a thermal efficiency because efficiencies imply some number between 0 and 1. Instead, we have this thing called a coefficient of performance. And if we're talking about a heat pump, we use the Greek letter gamma. But all of these characterization parameters are still the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. Here, the energy benefit, because we're in the hot part of the system, we're interested in heat that's going into the hot side, is the heat transfer that's being transferred into the hot side. The energy cost is that we have to run something like a compressor inside of our system, right? So there's some net power that's associated with running this thing, right? You gotta plug it into the wall and you're paying for that electricity, right? Now, Again, we can make the substitution from the first law on the whole system that the net power is equal to the magnitude of the heat rate in minus the magnitude of the heat rate out. Or the heat rate on the hot side minus the heat rate on the cold side. Right? And if it's an ideal or a Carnot heat pump, then I can replace that ratio of heat transfers with ratios of temperatures. So I can go T hot over T hot minus T cold. Notice that it's only really the numerator here that's not a temperature difference. So you could use Celsius or Fahrenheit in the denominator, but the numerator has to be in Kelvin or Rankine. So for me, whenever I'm doing these problems, I don't want to think about it. I just turn them all into absolute temperatures. Right? Um, there's no such thing as a Carnot heat pump. Right? But it is the limit of what's possible. So we can compare a real heat pump, how well it's performing, versus this ideal heat pump. And that'll tell us sort of how well our system is doing. We can do the same thing for a refrigeration unit or a refrigerator or an air conditioner. Right? But now our perspective changed. Because now we're not interested mostly in the heat that's going into the hot side. Instead, we're interested in cooling down the cold side. So the energy benefit here is going to change. Right? So here, we're removing heat from the cold side and eventually dumping it into the hot side. Right? Again, Clausius tells us you can't run a machine like Your fridge doesn't work very well if you don't plug it in. Right? 
We're still going to call this a coefficient of performance because unlike a thermal efficiency, it doesn't run between 0 and 1. But now we're going to use the Greek letter beta. If you don't want to worry about which Greek letter to use, you can just write COP for coefficient of performance. But I like to remember that beta goes with refrigerators because beta looks more like an R than gamma does. Right? But it doesn't really matter. If you just want to write COP, that's fine. Right? Again, because it's a characterization parameter for one of these cycles, it's energy benefit divided by energy cost. The only difference between a refrigerator and a heat pump is the energy benefit. And here, our energy benefit is the heat rate on the cold side. Right? So how fast are we removing heat from the cold side? The energy cost is still the power we're putting into the system. Right, so we do the same tricks, and now the equation for the ideal case looks almost exactly the same. It's just in the numerator, it's the cold side temperature and not the hot side temperature. Again, my advice to you is to always use absolute temperatures when you do these kind of problems. Just like uh, Carnot heat engines and Carnot uh, heat pumps, Carnot refrigerators don't exist. There's no such thing as an ideal process, right? That's the reversible version of what's happening. But even though this is kind of a cartoon of reality, it's a simple model, it's still useful. Because it gives us, um, first it tells us the limit of what's possible, but it also gives us a target to shoot for or something to compare against. Because we might, it's hard to know how well our real system is doing if we can't compare it to what the best system is. Right? And that is the end of this part of the lecture. We got one more part left. So I appreciate you, you know, coming through this sort of two and a half hours of lecture that we've done so far. We'll come back and do uh, one more section in about five minutes. So we'll come back at 9.04. Maybe 9.05. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming back. We did all of this already. So we are working on the second law, right? And this idea that um, we can do analyses of all of these different processes, right? We know that reversible processes are ideal processes. They don't actually exist. But even though it's kind of cartoonish, it's maybe a simple model, it's still useful because it gives us something to shoot for. It lets us know what's the limit of what's possible. Right? Also, when we're thinking about something like turbines and pumps, you know, we can use that comparison between the real and the ideal case to sort of tell us how well that component is doing. That's an isentropic efficiency. In an ideal case, if we're doing a second law analysis, that entropy generation rate is equal to zero. This can't actually happen, but it tells us the limit of what's possible. In a real case, we know it's the entropy generation rate that has to be positive, right? And we know if we get a negative entropy generation rate, it's, it, it can't happen in the universe, right? But we also talked about efficiencies of whole cycles, right? And if we do that, we can think about the ideal thermal efficiency for a heat engine is 1 minus the heat rate that we lose divided by the heat rate in. Right? These are magnitudes. But if it's an ideal process, we can say 1 minus T cold over T hot. Right? If you're doing this, this is not temperature differences, so it has to be Kelvin or Rankine. We can do similar things for refrigerators and heat pumps. Again, it's the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. The energy benefit in a heat pump is adding heat to the hot side. So that means it's going to be T hot on the top. But the energy benefit for a refrigerator is going to be removing heat from the cold side. So it's T cold on the top. Again, in both of these cases, you could get by using Celsius or Fahrenheit in the denominator. But my advice to you is just for these kind of problems, always use absolute temperatures. 
And then you'll never be wrong. So now we're going to do a Carnot heat engine example. All right, so here we have sort of the basic version of either a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant. This consists of four different components. There's a turbine. There's a condenser, which is going to condense, you know, the steam that comes out of the turbine, the low pressure steam that comes out of the turbine, put it to liquid so we can increase the pressure through a pump and then boil it so that it can go back into the turbine at high pressure steam. Right? And it asks us to find the thermal efficiency and the Carnot efficiency. So I'm going to go through this problem oops, as, I think it's this one, on the document here. All right, so this is the same thing. It's saying we have this system and we want to figure out what's going on in the system. Now, the first thing that I can draw here is a TS diagram, and it tells us that everything is ideal here, right? So we can say this is a TS diagram. Because the fluid is water, I need to draw a vapor dome. In this cycle, it tells me that everything happens under the vapor dome. We'll see that in a bit. This is a bad way to design a power plant, but I'm doing it to illustrate something that we'll see at the very end. So here I have a high temperature of 300 degrees and a low temperature of 10 degrees. When I go into my state one, which is going into my turbine, I go in at saturated vapor. This is state one. And it tells me, um, so what's going to happen here from state one, I'm going to go through, all these components are ideal, right? So remember when we talked about ideal turbines, that it's a vertical line down here to state two, or we could call it 2S because the entropy doesn't change. State 3 is going to move this way to state 3. And we know that state 4 here comes out of the pump. It tells us at a saturated liquid. So here, I don't know why it doesn't like it here. It erases stuff. So that means state 3, if this is an ideal pump, has to be vertically underneath state 4. When I draw these kind of diagrams, I like to remind myself what's going on in each process. So the purpose of the turbine is to produce power. The pump contributes power to the system. The boiler boils stuff. That means I add heat. And the condenser cools stuff down, so I remove heat. This is kind of queuing me up for what's going to happen in each one of these processes. So I'm trying to find the thermal efficiency. Now I've said for each one of these processes, I want to do conservation of mass, conservation of energy. And in this case, well, we'll see. I will do conservation or I will do the second law too, right? But here's the neat thing for all components. They're all going to be at steady state. And if I draw my control volume here for the condenser, just on the hot side, they're all one inlet and one outlet. Does that make sense? They're all kind of stacked together in series, right? So the inlet from the turbine is the outlet from the boiler. And the outlet from the turbine is the inlet to the condenser. And the outlet from the condenser is the inlet to the pump, and so on, right? All the way around. We call it a thermodynamic cycle because we keep just running around and around and around, right? So because we're at steady state, 
or one inlet and one outlet. Let's say for the turbine, right? So if I look at the turbine, zero is equal to m dot one minus m dot two, right? This means that m dot one is equal to m dot two, right? From the condenser, zero is equal to m dot two minus m dot three. So m dot two is equal to m dot three, right? For the pump, zero is equal to m dot three minus m dot four. And then for the boiler, running out of space, zero is equal to m dot four minus m dot one. So this is kind of a neat thing. If you have a bunch of components that are put together in series, that's at steady state, and each component only has one inlet and one outlet, there's only one mass flow rate, right? So m dot is equal to m dot one, is equal to m dot two, is equal to m dot three, is equal to m dot four. So there's only one mass flow rate in the system. Right now, I could do the first law on all these components, but first let's see what the problem is actually asking us to do. Right, so we'll justify our, our state, our assumptions as we move through the process, right? So here, if I come over here, I'll just give us some more space over here. Right, so what this problem is asking us for is the thermal efficiency. So I'll start over here, right? So the definition of thermal efficiency that triple equal sign is equal to the definition, right? This is the energy benefit divided by the energy cost. Thermal efficiency only makes sense for heat engines. So this is going to be net power divided by heat rate in. So the heat, it's only the heat in. This is basically saying when we're burning all this coal, how much of that heat did we turn into power? How much of that goes out onto the grid, right? But this net heat, I can look at my components here, or net power, sorry. There's two components that contribute to power, right? The turbine is producing power, right? Work in is negative, so work out must be, I'm expecting that number to be positive, but the pump is consuming power, right? This is gonna be the pump power, and I'm assuming that that's gonna be negative. Right. Now, the textbook will tell you that this is, they won't actually write it down like this. They'll say this is turbine power minus pump power over Q dot in, but they don't put the absolute value signs. And then they get equations that don't come from the first law. So I'm going to tell you to always use the first law. Right. So this is going to be the turbine power, which is positive. Oops. Plus the pump power, which is negative, divided by the heat rate in. This ends up being positive too, because it's heat in. The good thing about writing out this equation is I can see that I only actually care about to find the thermal efficiency. I care about the power coming out of the turbine, the power going into the turbine, and this heat going in from the boiler. So I don't have to do a first law analysis on the condenser for this problem. So now here, I'm going to start doing a first law analysis on the turbine, the pump, and the boiler. But because I'm lazy, I'm going to sort of do the symbolic part all at the same time. DE by DT is equal to Q dot minus W dot plus the sum of M dot in. I meant to say because I'm efficient, I'm going to do the first, the symbolic part all at the same time, right? This is H in plus V in squared over 2 plus G Z in minus the sum of M dot out h out 
plus v out squared over 2 plus g c out. For all of my components, I'm going to say they're all at steady state. I already did that in my conservation of mass analysis. They're all one inlet and one outlet. So these summation signs go away. There's only one inlet, one outlet. For all of these components, I'm going to neglect kinetic energy changes and potential energy changes. So these are going to go away for all of the components. Now, for the turbine and the pump, I'm going to say that they're adiabatic. And then for the boiler, I'm only doing the hot side. I'm only thinking about the water that's boiling, that's coming in as a liquid and going out as steam. So here I'll use my green thing for the boiler. And I'll say that this is passive or that W dot is equal to zero. So this is true for the boiler. So this means that if I'm trying to find power, so W dot is going to be equal to M dot times H in minus H out. When I look at the turbine, remember there's only one mass flow rate for the whole problem, right? That's what conservation of mass told us. The turbine, the inlet state is 1 and the outlet state is 2. So this is going to be h1 minus h2. The pump power is going to be m dot. For the pump, we move between state 3 and state 4. So these two equations are going to be important. Right? This is our equation 1 up here. This is, I guess, 2 and 3. And then when I do the boiler, what I'm going to find is that Q dot, this one's a little trickier to do in your head, but i got to move these terms to the other side, so it's going to be M dot times H out minus H in. Still the same mass flow rate, but if I look up here, H out is state 1, and H in is state 4. So this is going to be H1 minus H4. This is my equation 4, and I can put all of these into equation one, right, which was my turbine power plus my pump power. I'm going to let the first law worry about the signs divided by the heat rate in. All right, so this is going to be my thermal efficiency. This is like a scripted N or eta is equal to M dot H1 minus H2. That's my turbine power plus my pump power, which is M, I expect this to be a positive number, M dot my for my pump was H3 minus H4, that's negative, divided by the boiler heat rate in is M dot times H1 minus H4. The cool thing about this is that all the mass flow rates are the same. The problem didn't tell me the mass flow rate, but I don't care if I'm only interested in the thermal efficiency. So this, the good news is, my thermal efficiency is independent of m dot. This is going to be, oops, which means that I shouldn't write m dot in the equation. This is going to be h1 minus h2 plus h3 minus h4 divided by h1 
minus h4. Does that part make sense? All right, so we went through the first law for each one of these components, but we used the same common assumptions we'll often use for these components, right? So this is a good news, bad news situation. The good news is we've got um, an equation for the thing that we want. The bad news is, you know, I got one equation and five unknowns. But this is kind of where we want to be in thermodynamics because now I want to fix the states. For state one, it told me in state one that I have 300 degrees with a quality of one. Then that's a three Celsius X one is equal to one point oh. So here H one is equal to H G at three hundred degrees Celsius. Because I know what's coming, I'm also gonna get S one. This is gonna be S G at three hundred degrees Celsius. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to my tables here. I'm at 100 degrees Celsius. Which it looks like is not on my table. No, I'm at 300 degrees Celsius, right? 300 degrees Celsius. So it's this whole thing, right? Uh, what I want to get is I want to get H, G at 300 so this is 2749 kilojoules per kilogram and sg which is 5.7 i'm going to use the chat to write these things down 2749 and 5.7 i'm just going to leave it as 2749, this is kilojoules per kilogram. And S1 is 5.7, this is kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. I look through my state table and I see state 2. State 2 is not great because here the only thing that I know is that I have a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. That means I need to know something about the process. And what they told me for this problem is that it's an ideal turbine. Which means I can do a second law analysis, right? DS by DT is equal to q dot over t plus the sum m dot in s in minus the sum m dot out s out plus sigma dot but because this is ideal sigma dot is equal to zero we've already said that the whole thing is at steady state that the turbine is adiabatic and that there's one inlet and one outlet. So those mass flow rates are the same. This means zero is equal to m dot in s in minus m dot out s out. Since the mass flow rates are the same, m dot s in minus s out is equal to zero. So s of 2s is equal to s1. Now I did that on my TS diagram, but if I didn't draw my TS diagram correctly, that's okay, because the math tells me, right? So here, anytime you're moving between one state where you know two pieces of information and some other state where you only know one piece of information, try to think about what you know about the process. So this means that S2S is equal to S1, 
which was this 5.7 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. But this is at 10 degrees Celsius. Now, when I drew my TS diagram, if I go vertically down from state one to state two, I have to still be under the vapor dome. So I can go over here and I know that this has to be a two phase mixture. And I can use my quality equation, x of 2s is equal to s of 2s minus sf over sg minus sf, where all of this is evaluated at 10 degrees Celsius. I'm not going to do the math here, but I'll show you where I would get the numbers from. So now I would go down to my table. And I see that I'm at 10 degrees Celsius, so I'm over here. I know that S, I have S, F, and S, G. So I can get those, well, right? Maybe I can, but I can get those from the table, right? And then here I'll also get H, F, and H, G. So the process here is a lot like when we were keeping specific volume constant, right? And so from here, because I know S2 and SF and SG, here I can find the quality at state two. I can also use this quality equation to find H2S, and that's gonna be equal to HF plus X2S, times hg minus hf, right? Now, if I started at this equation, I would say, oh, this is good because I can look and I can find H, um, hf and hg. I'm trying to find h2s, but I don't know x of 2s, right? And that's when I'd say, oh, I need to use the fact that s2s is equal to s1. I put that in here that makes it so I know X2S and I can get H2S. Does that part make sense? Okay, so let's revisit our equation and we'll see where we're at. It's always good to take stock. This is like, you know, if you ever make a checklist, sometimes you like put some stuff in the check checklist over there you've already done so you can check stuff off. I like doing that, right? Here I know H1. I know H2. I don't know H3 or H4. Right? But here, I can think, oh, this is an ideal pump. Right? And remember, for ideal pumps, we don't actually have to know delta H. We can say for an ideal pump, well, here, I'll do the derivation down here just so we can remember what's going on. For an ideal pump, we're trying to find H3 minus H4S. This is the same thing as U3 plus P3B3 minus U4 plus P4B4. But because in an ideal pump, T3 is approximately equal to T4, the change in the uh, delta U is approximately equal to zero. Also, V3 is approximately equal to V4, which is approximately equal to one over a thousand meters cubed per kilogram. So now here, I know that I can make this approximately equal to the specific volume. I'm going to say state 4 in this case because I have enough information at state 4. I know at state 4, 
I know I have 10 degrees Celsius and x is equal to 0. Times P3 minus P4. Where do I get these pressures from? So this is PSAT, the boiling temperature at 10 degrees minus PSAT, the boiling temperature at 300 degrees. So I get those pressures from over here. They're nice to me. They're in kilopascals, 1.23, I'm going to say. And... Well, this one's in megapascal, so I got to see that the units change. So this is 8.58 megapascals. So this is going to be approximately equal to 1 over 1,000 meters cubed per kilogram times about 1.23 kilopascals time or minus megapascals right so that's a kilopascal is a thousand right a megapascal is a thousand more than that right so this is going to be eight five eight zero kilopascals Right, so here, this is almost zero, right? So here, I can uh, approximate this as 1.23 minus 8580 divided by 1,000, right? This is about minus 8.58 kilojoules per kilogram because this, this kilopascals is kilonewtons per meter squared. The meter squared, meters cubed divided by meter squared gives me meters. Kilonewton meters is kilojoules per kilogram. But, so that gives me in my equation up here, that gives me a value over here, right, that I can put in. I know this. It turned out to be negative. That's good. But I need H4, right? So H4 is going to be HF at 10 degrees Celsius. So here I'm going to go to 10 degrees. HF is 42 kilojoules per kilogram. Right? So that's good. I've got all these numbers that I can put into my equation. Right, so now I've got, I got all of these things. Right? So now if I come back over here, I can see that I know, wrong part of the problem, I have fixed all of these states or at least fix them enough that I have numbers for everything I know all these H values so if I put this in to my equation I can find that my thermal efficiency in this case was just over 50 percent right so half of the heat that I put in comes out as work half of it I need just to cool the engine off and I think you'll agree that going through this process took kind of a long time, right? Maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. And I really, when I was doing it, I skipped a few steps, right? I didn't find all the numbers, right? But you can follow along in the notes to see how those numbers, how we got those numbers. But what do we do if we only care about the Carnot efficiency, right? So Calvin and Planck, they told us that the Carnot efficiency can be 1 minus T cold over T hot, right? Or T out over T in. T cold minus T hot. I don't have temperatures outside my system, 
but I can use the absolute temperatures here, right? My T cold is 10 degrees. That's the best estimate that I have for that, right? My T hot is 300 degrees. That's the best estimate that I have for that. I put that into my equation and in one minute, I got the same answer, right? This only happened in this case for two reasons. So first, I said that the system was ideal. So because the system was ideal, I didn't have to do a first law analysis on all the components because I had a hot temperature and a cold temperature. Now these numbers would have also been a little bit different if I didn't keep the whole system inside the vapor dome, which you wouldn't really do in a real situation. But I just wanted to show you that it's possible to calculate this thermal efficiency by looking individually at each of the components, which we'll get lots of experience doing as we move forward. Or if I know T hot and T cold, I can just figure out what the ideal efficiency is by using the Carnot efficiency equation. And that is all that I had for you today. Um, it's funny because we just wrote the first midterm, but we're getting pretty close. We've probably now covered more than half of what we're going to do for the second midterm. So, like I said, we're drinking from the fire hose here. We're going really quick. Um, but this idea of how do we do open systems, right? Finding control volumes, doing conservation of mass, doing the first law, doing the second law, and then sometimes using these Carnot equations. Um, that's a little bit what we're doing. And then we're going to do the first, the most basic version of a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant will also test on the second midterm. But that's all that I have for you today. Um, like I said, grades for the midterm and the homework up until 2B is posted. Uh, homework 2B is due by the end of today, although I'll accept it until Wednesday because uh, I know you you might be a little bit thermoed out after just doing the exam. Uh, so I'll accept it till Wednesday uh, at midnight without penalty. And I will see you all on Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank Thanks you so much. Have a good night.